So, uh, if you recall, Paul, he went three years at Arabia, at verse 17, studying directly from God face to face. Then he returned again unto Damascus. Now, you'll notice that when he went to Jerusalem, he was there 15 days to talk to Peter. And I told you last time that when he talked to Peter, he was learning many things about uh, how Jesus' life was and how he ran things. We're also going to look at verse 19. 19. So here we begin. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. So you'll notice right here that the apostle Paul, he didn't see the other apostles, except James, the Lord's brother. So Paul the apostle, uh, yeah, that's right, Paul the apostle, I taught you last time, he visited several people. So then, first of all, he was directly taught by God for three years. Then he went to Peter after that for 15 days. Then he went to see James, the Lord's brother. Now you can see a pattern right here. What Paul's trying to do is accumulate knowledge. So it is important that when you grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you go and accumulate knowledge and you study. It is very important to study from different people. So here's James, the Lord's brother. Now, because James is the brother of Jesus, you can imagine Paul had a lot of interesting things with Peter. What was it like to be his disciple? What was it like to study under Jesus' ministry? But then when it went to James, James is the Lord's brother. So then he get to understand the so-called missing years of Jesus. So there's a lot of people online who are infatuated. Oh, what are the missing years of Jesus in the Bible? Because in the Bible, it doesn't record what happened to Jesus ever since the age of 12 to the age of 30. We have no idea what happened over there. So then Jesus Christ, during those missing 18 years, there's a lot of people online that's throwing in a lot of different ideas of what they suppose this may have happened, that may have happened, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is this, is that the Apostle Paul... He got his learning from James, the Lord's brother. So James would be the person who would know about the things that Jesus went through. So when people try to discredit the Apostle Paul, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then they try to give you this mysticism or Gnostic teachings about what Jesus actually did during those missing 18 years. You can just shut off and ignore the videos over there. You can write a bad comment and say, this is heresy, okay? Yeah. But the point is this. The point is, is that these people don't know what they're talking about. Because Paul directly talked and communicated with James, who was with Jesus during those missing 18 years. So you can imagine, uh, Paul, if you are him, what kind of questions you ask James. So what did Jesus do when he was young? Did he fight, fight with the other siblings? Who was, how did he deal with his siblings? I could sure learn some lessons from that when me and my brother fight. So I would be very interested in that kind of stuff. So the thing is, is that you can imagine how amazing it is. What, did, what was Jesus' favorite food when he was young? Did he play sports? What did he do? So this is something very uh, close and intimate that Paul is learning from James about the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, he's a great apostle because he's learning it from the chief Christian leader that day, Peter. James was a direct brother of Jesus Christ, but more importantly, God for three years. Yeah, so Paul, yes, he is definitely an important figure at the New Testament. Don't you think Satan wants to attack that person? Mm -hmm. So you got to watch out for these heretics out there who attack the Apostle Paul. Okay, let's keep reading right here. So again, verse 19, Paul, he didn't see any of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother, and then Peter. So he didn't see the other ones. Now look at verse 20. Now the things which I write unto you. Behold, before God I lie not. Okay, let me explain. Now the things which I write unto you. So Paul is saying that everything that he wrote to us, including the Pauline epistles that he wrote to us. Behold, before God. So before the face of God, he's promising that I lie not. He did not lie. So the thing is this, is that when you look at the Apostle Paul's writings, you can tell and you can know that this man is not lying because he put it before God 
And in order to defend himself from his critics, no kidding, 2,000 years later, he still has critics criticizing him that this is not a legit apostle. So Paul, he had to argue that I was directly taught from God, I even talked to Peter, and I even talked to James, the Lord's brother. And then he finalizes at the end, which is very important. He says, before God, I lie not. And that's very important. That's why it's interesting that in court, what would they have you do? They would put your hand on the Bible, and then they would make you swear. Because as if like this, people who are in the witness stand, they'll take it more seriously. Yeah. But now people have taken this like a tradition or a custom, and they'll just lie through their teeth on the witness stand. Mm -hmm. But the thing is this, is that if you're a saved Christian, and you put your hand on the Bible, Come on. and you say all kinds of blah, 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 you got to realize this. God's, God judge me at the judgment seat of Christ if I'm lying to you. Yeah. When you do that, yeah. that's going to put more conviction in you, more carefulness, and before you spit out things out of your mouth, you'll be more careful after that. Uh -huh. I noticed also if I ever argue with a person, whenever I would say that line, the person has a hard time arguing with me after that. You might say, why? Because the person knows that I'm not lying now. Yeah. That I'm really serious about this, that he's, he really believes this. So when I do that, the person knows that I'm serious about it. So sometimes uh, I would use that line when I talk to people, or especially if I'm in a bad fight, I would use that. I would, or when I preach, like, God, strike me dead at the judgment seat of Christ, or get on me if I'm lying to you right here. And that helps a person be more convinced. That's why Paul used the same thing as well as a preacher. He wanted the people to believe him. So he put himself where before God that he didn't lie. So God strike the apostle Paul dead, Judge him severely at the judgment seat of Christ if he's lying. Now, you try that when you have a disagreement or a fight or something, or you're trying to convince a person. You'll be more of an honest person after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it'll be helpful for you and the other people involved. That's what I did in my life as well sometimes. Okay, verse 21. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So the Apostle Paul, he, after he, uh, verse 19... Talked to James, the Lord's brother. He was getting knowledge about how Jesus Christ was like as a child. And then Peter, how Jesus Christ was like at the ministry. And then back at Arabia, before God, three years, what was God uh, really planning out for the church? But after that, then verse 20, he's saying, I did not lie. And then verse 21, he went after visiting these people, <clears throat> he went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Let's keep reading. And was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea. So Paul, he's saying right here that when he went to Syria and Cilicia, he was also not known by face to the churches of Judea. Now, you'll notice right here throughout the past verses, Paul was saying, I did not see the other apostles except James and Peter. I was unknown by face by the churches here. The reason why he's saying this you got to think about this. Why is Paul so private in doing this? Why would he do that? Well, think about this. Paul, what was he before he got saved? Yeah, he persecuted Christians. Yeah. So because he was persecuting Christians, the apostle Paul, he realized that he can't just go around everywhere. So he had to do this privately. So that's why he was not known by face to the churches there, because he was going to those houses and persecuting Christians there. So he had to do this privately and secretly. Now, what is very interesting is this. The regions, you'll notice here at verse 21 and verse 22, is where it's like between Israel and the region of Syria. Now, think about this. If you're going to think about the two best nations that the Lord used uh, throughout the Bible, there are two nations that you can think of. Whether you like it or not, it's Israel. Israel is definitely one of them. So no, God is not done with the Jews. Get, get your hands off the land. Leave them alone. Amen. The Lord's already dealing with other Jewish elites. The Lord's dealing with them severely. Their time is coming. But the second nation you'll notice, and I'm talking about physical nation, not spiritual. Another physical nation you'll notice is Syria. Yeah. You might say, why is that? Go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. 
Syria, the reason why this is very important for us is because it is where they were first called Christians. That's where Christianity started, the term, the name Christian. Not only that, the King James Bible, that's yeah. where it came from. It Amen. came from the manuscripts of Antioch, Amen. Syria. So we also call this the traditional text. So then you got Olivetan French, Diodati Italian. You also got Luther's German. And then you got the Spanish Valera. <clears throat> you got the English Tyndale, which eventually morphed into the English King James Bible. And then you got Erasmus's Greek, and then went through Biza, Stephanus, Colonnaeus, etc., etc. So all these manuscripts are originated from Syria, the region of Syria. And they make up the majority of manuscripts as well. In fact, even modern scholars cannot deny that. No matter how much they want to cry and whine, it still makes up the majority of manuscripts. So they want to go by four little manuscripts, or two mainly, to try to say, we're going to correct everything through these two manuscripts, etc. So the traditional text, this is where it came from. The King James Bible also came from Syria. But here's also a very interesting thing. If you know a little bit about the first centuries of church history, when Roman Catholicism was morphing and turning more official, it was known as the rest Western churches that time, or Roman churches, and they had their own line of manuscripts that time. Another thing about them is that uh, Alexandria, Egypt, they were morphing with their churches, their own text as well. But what's so interesting is that there's a group of Sir uh, people from Syria known as the Nestorians. These guys were kicked out both by Alexandria and the Western churches. That means, you know, these groups were the right bunch. One thing that's interesting about Syria is that they strongly believed, or the Nestorians, they strongly taught this. Literal. Taking the verse literally. Amen. They strongly believed that. So they believed in every word that you take literally. Whereas Alexandria, Egypt, because they've just been stuffing their noses with so much book and philosophy, they had the habit of making everything figurative or metaphorical. Because why? They were too smart so they can make the text read whatever way they want to. That's right. So then, they believe, Syria, it is a matter, it is a historical fact, they believe every word. Every word it should be interpreted literally. Another thing about them is that since they were kicked out by Alexandria and the Catholic Church, it was called the Western Church that time. So let's put Alexandria and Rome. What's very interesting about these guys is that they were soul winners. So when they were kicked out by Alexandria and Rome, they were known to be fervent soul winners. That's why it is very possible that Korea may have heard the gospel at the first centuries. If not Korea, as far as China. The reason why is this is because of that silk route that connected Rome. Uh, it actually went all the way to Antioch, Syria, believe it or not. It reached that far, and then it can go all the way to China, the Silk Route, if you go on both ends. But then the Nestorians, see, they were being persecuted. So where were they going? They were being pushed. So they were being pushed more to the east, and they were known for, like, planting churches all over. As a matter of fact, uh, the emperor of China, during s around 600 ADs, he ordered that 200 buildings be built for the Christians in China. Now, how, why would you order 200 if there weren't already Christians there before 600 yeah, AD? Yeah, right. See, that's something very interesting to think about. That is historical archaeological evidence from what is called the Nestorian steel. But that's a whole different story. I'm not going to get into that. The point is this. There are undoubtedly two nations the Lord used. That's the point. So Syria, when you hear that, that means something good right there. Okay, so we're going to look at Galatians, uh, Acts chapter 11. Excuse me, Acts chapter 11. Look at how God used Christianity. By the way, that's where the word of the Lord was preached. Yeah. <clears throat> Acts chapter 11. We'll look at verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. Okay, so remember, Israel was the nation God mightily used. But there's another group. And they sent forth Bar Barnabas that he should go as far as where? Antioch. Antioch is a city in Syria. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Uh, we'll look at verse 
25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek who? Saul. Saul. Now, for those of you who don't know, Paul's name before he got saved was Saul. So before he was called Paul, he was known as Saul. And Saul noticed that he had access to Antioch, Syria at that time. Notice that there is no verse in the Bible where Peter or Paul went to Rome. That's right. Only yeah. Paul went to Rome later on. But before yeah. he went to Rome, he went to where? He went to Assyria. Mm -hmm. So you know Syria is very important. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in where? Antioch. Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. See? Christianity originated in Israel, but the term, its name, came from Syria. So there's no doubt these are the two nations God used. So the Apostle Paul, he's definitely got a lot of credentials right here, a lot of legitimacy. To reject his writings is just sheer nonsense. To go by some abstract skeptical manuscripts that have Gnostic teachings. It's oh, very strange to yeah. me.